Revelation 13, beginning at verse 11, reading to verse 18. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. As we begin, let me lay a foundation by saying something that we all ought to remember. And that would be that one of Satan's chief weapons that he uses is deception. That's because at the core of his being, the Bible makes it very clear that Satan is a liar and he is a deceiver. In John chapter 8, for example, verse 44, Jesus said this. He said, you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. And so we know that Satan is a liar. Jesus made it very clear. He is a liar. He is a deceiver. Now, since Satan is a deceiver, it only makes sense that those who are under his influence would also be deceivers. His agents that you see in Scripture and those who will be in existence during the last days, his agents misrepresent themselves in order to appear as ministers, and they always want to appear as ministers of truth. Now, these deceivers will be used by Satan in order to spread his lies. And so in light of this, False teachers are spoken of often in Scripture. Warnings against false teachers are found in numerous books of the Bible. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, for example, it says, There were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. In 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3, Paul said, The Spirit expressly says that, in latter times, there will, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. You see warnings against deception throughout the Bible. Just considering the New Testament for a moment, there are warnings concerning deception and false teachers found throughout the writings of the New Testament. All four Gospels warn us against deceivers. The book of Acts warns us against deceivers. Romans warns us. First and second Corinthians warns us. Galatians warns us. Ephesians warns us against deceivers. Philippians, Colossians. 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd uh, Timothy, Titus, Hebrews, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd John, Jude, Revelation, all speak concerning false teachers. You can find warnings throughout the New Testament. Almost every New Testament book warns us against deception. False prophets have attempted to undermine God's truth from the very beginning. In the Old Testament, they arose early to oppose God's word and 
in order to destroy God's people. You see it in, in the fifth book of the Bible, the book of Deuteronomy, where God speaks concerning warnings of deceivers when he says in chapter 13, verses 1 through 3 of Deuteronomy, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after some other gods, uh, which you have not known, let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. He said, from the beginning, there will be people, once truth is revealed, that will come and bring a lie. You see it from the beginning. Jeremiah chapter 23, 16 says, uh, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you, they are leading you into futility. They speak a vision of their own imagination, not from the mouth of the Lord. And so in the Old Testament, and, and to be honest with you, I could, I could spend so much more time just, you know, chapter and verse, chapter and verse, chapter and verse, from the Old to the New Testament with warnings against deception. In the last days, they will once again be working overtime to undermine people's faith in Jesus Christ. Satan will be working even harder to deceive the world as his own doom approaches. Because of this, Jesus warned the church to be on guard against false teachers. And in Matthew 7, 15, he said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. He had said in Matthew 24, 11, Many false prophets will arise and will deceive many. Now, the chief doctrine, that is presented by these false teachers is simply this. And you might want to note this. It's just a very basic thing. The chief doctrine is Jesus is just not necessary. That's the number one message of a false teacher. Jesus really isn't necessary. They'll say things like, well, he's, he's only one of many teachers. He's not more important than any other teacher. Now, obviously, that isn't what Jesus taught. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So Jesus would disagree with that. Uh, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No other name. Jesus said it himself. It's repeated throughout the New Testament. When you, uh, when you look for certain essentials, certain basics, what has been called certain fundamentals of the Christian faith, uh, you will find that there are certain essential building blocks uh, to Christianity. Um, there's the inerrancy and inspiration of Scripture. There is the deity of Jesus Christ. There is the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. There's the substitutionary atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And you have the physical resurrection and the personal bodily return of Christ to the earth. These are basic fundamentals. These are essentials of faith. These are the things that are called building blocks that we build our lives on. But these are the things that false teachers will argue against. The inspiration and inerrancy of the scriptures say, well, you know, it's just words. It's just men's words, and there are mistakes in it. The deity of Jesus Christ will say, well, no, Jesus was a man, a good man, but he wasn't God in the flesh. The virgin birth of Christ, they'll say, no, no, it's not a virgin that's spoken of there in the book of Isaiah. What it's speaking of is a young woman shall conceive and, and bear a son. The substitutionary atoning work of Christ, they'll say, well, he did that at that time for a certain group of people, but that's only applying for a certain time, but not for all time. And there are other people out there who have truth that they're bringing. The physical resurrection and personal bodily return of Jesus Christ, they'll say, well, you know, uh, you Christians have been saying that Jesus Christ was resurrected. There's absolutely no proof that he was. And as far as him returning, there's no proof that he even walked the face of the earth. And so there are people who do argue this. And, and there are some people that actually occupy pulpits who don't believe the things that I just mentioned to you. And yet they're occupying pulpits even now. These are the primary doctrines that Satan works overtime to undermine. And he does that through the false prophets. He does that through false teachers. Now, when we were last together, I was sharing with you concerning Antichrist. And, and we're going to be continuing on in this particular study, chapter 13. And, and uh, as I was sharing with you concerning the Antichrist, uh, he's going to be a, a final world ruler. 
who will have both political and he will have a religious influence, even a power over people. Now, from the political perspective, as we've been seeing, he's going to be a world ruler. He's going to command and he's going to lead as what Daniel would refer to as a willful king. He's a political leader. But he's also a religious, has a religious, um, uh, if you will, a religious deception. And this false prophet that we're looking at is the one who really promotes this aspect. But people will worship him through the influence of this false prophet. When you look at uh, 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, uh, Paul said, the coming of the lawless one, Antichrist, will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. He will use counterfeit miracles, counterfeit signs and wonders. Uh, there have been movements in the church, um, even in recent years, where people have... Uh, said that some extraordinary works are occurring and uh, that these works are from God. I, I've, I've heard the, uh, the testimonies, uh, uh, TV testimonies of how God causes uh, gold dust to come settling and filtering into the room and settling on people, gold dust and, and uh, you know, things of that nature, ashes that are being miraculously formed on the tip of the tongue of the speakers and and, and things that are so bizarre and so odd, and yet um, it, it seems sometimes that no matter how weird the statement, there'll, there'll be somebody who will not only believe it, but will also promote it, because they really believe that. And then they, they sometimes have spoken to me about it, and uh, when I don't agree uh, that that is something that is true, then they get upset and think I have no faith. It's just a really odd kind of thing, and, and, uh, but that's happening even to this day. You see, Antichrist is going to have a false prophet. And this false prophet will go before him and will encourage people to wonder after and worship this beast. There's going to be a partnership between political and religious powers. And Antichrist is going to establish a false religious system. He himself will be in the center of it, and he will demand worship. Now, at a certain portion in the tribulation, that will be the only religion tolerated by Antichrist. Now, when he says in verse 11, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. When he says, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, the earth would speak of uh, unredeemed uh, human beings, the unredeemed. Uh, so the earth, well, we were created from the dust of the earth. And so he sees another beast coming out of the, out of the earth. It would speak of th that this prophet is, is a human being. And what's going to happen is the false prophet is going to be appealing to those who are not saved. His words and his works are going to be accepted by those who are susceptible to delusion. How do you become susceptible to delusion? I'll say this briefly. Don't read the Bible. You'll be susceptible to delusion. Just don't read the scriptures. And somebody will come up, knock on your door, and will say to you something that's not found in scripture, but because you don't read the Bible, you won't know that. And so they'll say things to you sometimes. Even that can happen to this day. It happens every day. Here in the United States, somebody's knocking on somebody's door and somebody's saying something about Jesus that's not scriptural. And there are people listening to what's being said. And because they don't read the Bible and they're not capable of understanding yet, discerning yet, or perhaps they're not schooled yet, or having an interest to be schooled, they end up being deceived. Because these deceivers will say something to them that is appealing to them. You might find this interesting. The word deception is also used for the, uh, the Greek word for deception is also a word that can be used for seduction. Interesting. Because what deception is, is actually seduction. And the way somebody is seduced normally is the person doing the seducing 
is saying something to that person that is appealing to them. And the way that you can be seduced, we used to say the guy's just got a line or he's charming. He's basically simply saying something that that victim wants to hear. Whether it is, oh, you're the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Or that, you know, I love the way your hair has got it just flows beautifully. What kind of perfume is that? Oh, man, that is so good. And you know what? Did you just get, you didn't get some, you didn't get some work done on you, did you? You didn't, oh, man, you are so, I'm sorry. I just have, you know, this charming garbage, you know. But there's something inside of that person, right, that wants to hear that. They want to hear it. They want to hear that they look like they've lost 10 pounds, even though they gained 20. <laughs> they do. There's something in us that when somebody says something, and listen, a, a con man is simply capable of, after a few conversations, of determining the thing that will work with you. That's all it is. It's just taking the time to study somebody, pick up on their insecurities, and begin to emphasize those insecurities in a positive spin. And it's just called seduction. But deception is a form of seduction. And so you may have a difficulty believing, for example, that Jesus Christ is actually God in the flesh. And so you ask yourself things like, if Jesus is God, then who was he praying to when he was here on earth? And a Jehovah's Witness will knock on your door and say, well, that's a great question because he's not God. And they'll give to you an answer that's not biblical, but it certainly appeals to the way you're looking at things at that time, and that's how it happens. I can, I can multiply that with different religious cults. They find something that you will have difficulty with, give you a reasonable explanation, even call it a logical one, and you want to be intellectually logical, don't you? And so you buy into that. And what is it? It's called mind seduction. It's called deception. And the false prophet is going to bring deception. Now, what we see here when it says in verse 11, I saw another beast this beast that's being referred to is the Antichrist's false prophet. Jesus had John the Baptist. Antichrist is going to have a false prophet. Now notice the description in verse 11. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. So that confirms his religious character. He appears to be a lamb. Now, in the New Testament, false prophets are revealed as something sometimes taking on the appearance of believers. You see, prophets would wear certain clothing that actually identified them as prophets. You may or may not know that, but in Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 and 16, Jesus said it like this. He said, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will know them. You will recognize them. Prophets at that time wore a certain garb. And so the outer appearance was like a true prophet. So false prophets are revealed in Scripture often as taking on the appearance of a true believer. Now, that's why it's referred to as, as a lamb. Now, notice he had two horns. The two horns. Horns are symbolic of religious and political power. I mentioned to you that in the Old Testament, Horns very often were associated with power. And so this one here has uh, a religious and political power. Now, notice how it says he spoke like a dragon. Now, when it says he spoke like a dragon, that speaks of his message. His message is inspired and empowered by Satan. Revelation 12, 9, it said the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil Satan, who deceives the whole world. And so he spoke like a dragon, meaning the message that he speaks has that kind of charismatic power that, that comes from Satan himself. Remember in, all the way in the book of Genesis in chapter 3, 
how the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? And then when, when responded to, um, he spoke to her and said, you will not surely die. And so he, from the beginning, has contradicted and even added to the word of God, but he does so in a way that people will respond to. You see what's going to happen, guys? And, and people, uh, people today are doing the same thing. And, and I have to be careful because I don't want to take too much time developing things that, that, that I don't need to develop with you, but I'm going to for a moment anyway because this is something I think is very important. And I've been noticing I've, going, I've been going longer than I should. Joe told me that I shouldn't talk as long as I do. <laughs> but let's talk about this for a minute, shall we? Okay. Again, people are open to deception today. There's no doubt about that. Um, I have to be careful because I didn't prepare these statements. I just, they're, they're, they're things that I want to share with you a little bit about, and I have to formulate how I want to say them even before I begin to start speaking here. I, I will say that I've been a Christian for a while now. I will say at, that as a Christian, there were certain things as a brand new Christian that were emphasized to me that helped me to get s settled into uh, my Christian faith. When I first went forward and I gave my heart to Christ, I actually didn't go forward. I stood up and then I went into the back into a room and spoke to a follow-up minister. But when I committed my heart to Christ and had that follow-up experience, the man who was following up with me, who was sharing with me some of the essentials of the faith that I had just embraced, made sure that he told me to read the Word of God every day. So from the day that I got saved, I was exhorted to read the Word of God, which I began a habit of doing uh, because I had been encouraged to do that. And, and so I got a Bible that was called The Good News for Modern Man. You know, I was a person who at that time didn't read an awful lot. I had just returned to reading. I hadn't been reading for a long time. The lifestyle that I was living, being filled with alcohol and drugs, didn't really leave much time for me to read good books. But I had started reading again and began to read several books. As a matter of fact, I began the habit of reading before getting saved. I think basically the Lord was preparing me for a lifetime of reading because I had started reading books again. And as that had taken place, I am now being told by a follow-up counselor that you need to read the Bible. And so I started reading the Bible. I started with this, this, it was called the Good News for Modern Man, which was a paraphrase. But a paraphrase is not a translation. A paraphrase is simply taking phrases from the scripture and changing the wording to make it understandable. But it's not a translation, it's a phrasing. And so I knew that that wasn't a literal translation, and so I went out and bought what is called the Layman's Parallel uh, Bible, which actually what it was, was it had the King James Version, and it had three other translations. And so I would read the King James. And then I would, if I didn't understand that old language, I would look at the modern translations to figure out what the word was that I wasn't understanding with the King James. And so that's how I began to learn to read the Bible. And I started reading the King James, and I started teaching my Bible studies from 1973 until 1983 were always King James, always. So I learned over the 10 years of studying to pretty much interpret the King James ancient English. And then I used to actually, I would change the words as I was teaching to modern language. And then the new King James came out and I was able to begin to teach out of the new King James. But when I do studies for word studies, I still go back to the King James. So that's my habit to this day. And that's a habit that's been going for over 40 years uh, since I started to teach and since 1983 when I started using the New King James. So I say all of that to say this, that in the years that I've been studying the Word of God, I have had the opportunity to hear a number and a variety of teachings that have come uh, from supposedly the church that when you begin to read the Bible and compare the Word of God with what's being said, you discover that there, is, there are things being said that simply are not true. And so over the first several years in the history of this church, 
because my first heart, if I was not a pastor, was to be an apologist. I wanted to be somebody who understood the essentials of my faith, the systematic theology of it, in order to actually communicate it and understand it better because systematic theology is something a lot of people are not familiar with, but it's, it's something that helps you to know what the, what the cardinal essential things of faith really are. So that's really where my interest was. And were I not a pastor, I would be a systematic theologian because that's really what I am interested in on a personal level. With that said, I hear things being said on TV, and I would bring that to this pulpit early on. I'll give you an example. I hear somebody say that uh, he was teaching, and the Holy Spirit came upon him so wonderfully that he stepped off the pulpit, hovered in the air without gravity pulling him down, awakened to the reality that he was just kind of hovering in the air by the power of the Holy Spirit, and then he had to step back onto that, onto that platform before he hit the ground because his faith wasn't going to be sufficient. And there are people who are saying, oh, that's amazing. And I'm saying, this is nonsense. This is absolute nonsense. Where did you get that? Or the time this fellow gets up and he says, this is going to have a problem. You're going to have a problem with this theologically. This is probably going to disturb your personal theology. But it's true. I can tell you it's true. It happened to me. He said, I cast a demon out of myself. Now, see, some of you probably think, oh, is that right? Can you do that? No. As a matter of fact, the demon wasn't cast out of him. It was still in him. It's a lion demon, and it's probably there to this day. <laughs> but see, but I would bring that to you, not you in particular. Some of you were with me, and I would bring it to the church, and I'd say, and then you get the believers who get mad at you. How can you say that about a brother? How can you say that you are judging your brother? And I'm thinking, Jesus said that we are to judge righteous judgment. He taught us that. Judge righteous judgment, correct judgment, profitable judgment, the correct, be discerning. And that's when I started saying things to the church. I'd say, babies will put anything in their mouth. You have to watch a baby, don't you? Every mama in this room knows that for a fact. You better watch those babies because they may see something that's poisonous, but it smells good, and they will put it in their mouth. But I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you over the years how many people have got offended with me for just loving them enough to tell them the truth and to warn them. I still remember teaching in this pulpit here before we built that other uh, um, uh, building over there, and saying, be careful with Mormonism, because Mormonism is a cult. And I shared why certain things, and then I get a letter. Well, Mormons are good people, they're nice, and, and they build beautiful buildings, and you shouldn't say things about them. And, and so, if people are saying, how can the world actually wonder after the beast? How can they say, who is like him? Who can make war against him? If believers themselves are not discerning enough to see some of the things that are being said are just absolutely not in Scripture, how much more so the world that does not respect Scripture at all. And when they see the signs and the wonders that will be performed, that will draw their attention to this false religious system and this false Messiah, they will be drawn to him. There's no doubt about it, and the Bible makes it very clear that that's what's going to take place. Matthew 24, 12 says this, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 13 and 14, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you have learned them. Continue in those things. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. After their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables. That's taking place even now. It will be rampant when Antichrist appears. Apathy exists concerning truth. 
Some don't even believe there's a possibility that something can be true. But there's an atmosphere, atmosphere of acceptance that will exist, and the false prophet will take advantage of it. Now, God ultimately will give man over to the inclinations of his own sinful nature. And after the rapture, Satan will have great power in deceiving people. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12, for this reason, God sends them powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. The false prophet is going to have a ready and willing audience. There will be believers on the face of the earth who will not be deceived, but there will be multitudes who hear what he has to say and will embrace it. Now notice in verse 12 how it says he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. So Satan gives Antichrist authority. Antichrist is now giving authority to this false prophet. He causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. Doing nothing without the Antichrist's approval, he causes people to worship Antichrist. He is going to promote total acceptance of the beast and the government of the beast. He's going to encourage a unified world government. There will be a global world village communalism. That's what's going to take place. In verse 13, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So he's going to perform lying signs and wonders. And people will be deceived by that. Notice in verse 14, he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And so notice in verse 14 how he makes it clear that he deceives those who dwell on the earth. That's his whole purpose is to deceive, and he builds an image of the beast. Now, verse 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now, imagine for a moment 2,000 years ago reading these words. Would you, how, would you, how would you interpret that? Was it possible then for that to take place? It would seem that it wasn't. Is this kind of thing possible now? Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. Um, what happens is there's a, an image that is, is made, and it becomes animated. And the people who look at it, will it'll have the appearance of being alive. Some, some uh, commentators say that it, perhaps this is a product of uh, genetic engineering. It could be a product of artificial intelligence. It could be a living computer, an animated, artificially intelligent cyborg. It could be an android. An, uh, 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 it's kind of like a robot that is created from biological materials, and it resembles a human being. Something is going to happen when, when people look at it, it will have a 100% appearance of being alive, of being real. Now. We've had some clumsy attempts at that all along. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember that uh, Mr. Lincoln exhibit at Disney, in Disneyland. Anybody, anybody remember that? That kind of like, you know, and we go, oh, wow, you know, it's so real. Uh, but we have advanced in our technology so that it, we're already moving in that direction where we can have an actual image that can look like a real human being. We're already moving in that direction. There's no reason why we can't believe that this can happen. Now, what's going to happen is it's going to be set up on the temple grounds. It's going to be connected with what is called the abomination of desolation. And when this took place, takes place, persecution will erupt. And the persecution against believers is even on a greater scale. You see, what's going to happen is people will refuse to worship this image. And when they refuse, they will be killed. It says in verse 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave. Now, this is something we, we, we know today, to receive a mark on the right hand or on their forehead. 
and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast, the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. It's the number of a man. His number is 666. Antichrist is going to have a system that is going to require identification, personal ID. Personal ID. You might find this interesting. When it, that word mark there, you know what that word can be, that word mark can be translated? It can be translated brand, a brand. It can also be translated a tattoo. Isn't that interesting? Tattoo on the forehead or on the hand. Again, it, guys, when I got saved 40 years ago, over 40 years ago now, and when we read this, when we first read this, marks, who in the world would put a mark on themselves? We, we thought that way. Who would put a mark on themselves? Right, you, you have to understand. Um, that when I grew up, my mom said, if you, if you get a tattoo, I will cut it off of you. <laughs> she did. My, my aunt, I have an aunt, my aunt, uh, I, yeah, got a tattoo on her, on her hand. And we're talking about back in the 50s. It was a cross, and it had little, little marks on it. My mom said that my aunt got really upset because there was a movement called the Pachuco movement at that time, and Pachucos would have that on their hand. So what did my aunt do? She got a razor blade. True story. And she cut it off. So my mom said, if you ever get a tattoo, we'll cut your hand off. Mama, Mama didn't like tattoos. Brands. Do people get brands today? Yeah, they do. You ever see somebody get those burn marks on their arms? That's a brand. So we are living in a time right now, and I don't want to sensationalize this, but we are living in a time right now that these kinds of things are very acceptable. They're very acceptable now where in my early life, they weren't. You see, the only ones who got tattoos when I was growing up were military personnel. And these were guys who would, you know, Navy guys who'd come back with some tattoo, you know, that they'd got in some bar or whatever. And that was kind of what you associated. So you'd see an anchor or something like that, and you'd know they were military, because military guys got that. Or if you were in a mo motorcycle kind of club or gang, you know, they got, the gangsters had that. Or if you were in prison, that was basically it. So you didn't see average, ordinary people with marks on their body. You just didn't. You didn't see them with that because that was kind of like what my parents would have said in that era would have said, well, those are people who just, you know, they're the rough kinds of people. They, they weren't raised right. I mean, all kinds of things. So you can imagine when my son David started getting tattoos, what I was going, whoa, 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 you. Because that's how I was, I was, you know, as a kid, raised. You had these ideas that, that you know, my son taught me <laughs> I was wrong about. Um, so, getting back to the Bible study. Marks on the hands, marks on the forehead. It is, a, it is something that relates to finances. Antichrist is going to need a system to distribute food. We, we've already seen that famine is going to be in existence. 50% of the earth's population has already been devastated. And so he is going to create a universal system that is associated with him that is based on a rationing system. Are we prepared for that right now? Do you think it's possible that our government could bring forth a program and argue its merit and convince people to get marks? I would have to say absolutely. What would lead this government to be capable of doing that is the question. And the answer would be, well, 
is there a way for us to be able to determine the uh, nationality of an individual? Because we do have people who are crossing borders illegally who are terrorists. Is there a way to have a national ID, a way for us to be able to identify that is painless? And the answer is yes. Are there chips that already exist that you can insert in skin? Absolutely. Absolutely, we already have that. We've been putting chips, microchips, in animals for a long time. The dog gets, gets lost and runs away, and, and they're able to locate them with that locator. They have that capacity of doing that. Right now, they've been able to do it for years. Will, will that be something that the Antichrist can use for his own purposes? Absolutely. It doesn't even have to be a tattoo. It doesn't even have to be a, a brand. It can be something that is as small as a, as a freckle that is placed on your hand, that the scanners that we have right now will be capable of picking up all that information, and that will be able to prove whether or not you have a right to purchase food. And so this number, this numbering system is going to take place. We're already prepared for it. We have numbers already, social security numbers. We have debit cards. We have charge accounts. We already use scanners. There are implants and microchips. These things exist now that did not exist 2,000 years ago when this was written. This shows you how current prophecy really is. And what's interesting he says in verse 17, no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Three, when you look at what is called the subject of biblical numerics, when you look at the number three, three is the number of completion. Three is the number of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It can be the number of God. The number six is the number of man. Three is the number of God. Six is the number of man. Three sixes is man attempting to be God. That's where six, six, six comes in. Three sixes, man attempting to be God. Antichrist is going to have a power and authority, a false prophet who performs miracles, who cause people to regard Antichrist. He's going to create a system where people are not able to buy or sell. Now, if anybody takes the mark of that beast, there will be no forgiveness for them. They have sealed their fate. There will be a false religion on a scale never seen before, and that false religion is on its way even now. The world is being prepared. If you look right now on the horizon, try and find one amazing world ruler, one world leader. Try and find one, and you're not going to find any. There aren't any right now. And so that makes a void. And with that void will come an antichrist who will step right into it. And the people will begin to wonder after him. He will have a false prophet who will be able to deceive. He will point people towards this beast. The system will be in place. You cannot buy and you cannot sell without our numeric system. If you take that, that mark you have sealed your fate. Refusing the mark will mean that you're going to be beheaded. You will die. And so this system is already moving in the direction of being in place. The Bible, though written, this was written almost 2,000 years ago, is current for the 21st century because we're seeing these things even in our day.